Jim Jordan swings twice and misses. It looks like he will get a third vote. Will that be the last? I mean, the numbers are going in the wrong direction. I mean, you just showed that uh, that, that chart a couple minutes ago. You know, he lost 20 votes the first time, 22 the second. Um, there's all sorts of reporting and all sorts of buzz out there that, um, that you know, maybe he could, might even lose more on the next vote. Uh, I know that, you know, they're... The, uh, Jordan does have, you know, to support a bulk of, you know, the bulk of the, the conference. But the thing is, is, you know, you, you need almost every Republican to vote for you on the floor, given how closely divided the House is. And, and boy, it's just difficult for any Republican to get there. And so it looks like Jordan's going to get another chance here. But as we sit here now, I mean, maybe something changes overnight. I mean, it's a fast moving situation. But does it really seem like things are really going to break in his favor? I mean, just based on what we've seen so far, it doesn't seem that way. Yeah, and there's been members who are not voting for, for Jordan. The indication are is that they won't be flipping at least very easily, who have said that this isn't about policy like it was in the case of Kevin McCarthy back in January, that fundamentally it is the issue of Jim Jordan, the individual, not being right for the job. Is this someone who does appropriately represent the Republican Party at this point? How, does that, how should it make us think of, of the Republican Party more largely? Uh, look, I think that you know when Jordan was you know first in Congress, I and mean, he's been he's been there for for almost two decades now. Um, you know, he was someone who's seen as sort of on the, the far right fringe of the of the House Republican Conference. But you know, the House Republican Conference has gotten more conservative and kind of more anti-establishment and combative over time, and has sort of moved closer to where Jordan is. But clearly, there are still uh, you know a, a more than enough members who are not comfortable with Jordan being the, the leader of the House Republicans that they're blocking him. The problem is. is is that um, you know, Congressman Lamolfo was just on. He was talking about how there, there are any number of people who could who could do the job, and I think he's probably right about that, at least to some extent. But who can actually get enough votes to you know, and, and not you know, only lose a, a relative handful and be able to get the job? And that's where this is a very difficult and thorny problem for Republicans. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you're out with some pretty interesting polling data today from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. And it kind of paints the picture of what's behind uh, a lot of these lawmakers' decisions, what's brought the division here in Washington. And it seems to have uh, an echo effect here. And it's not looking great for both parties. I'm sure you can speak to this, uh, Kyle. Uh, those exploring alternatives to democracy, 31 percent of Trump supporters, 24 percent of Biden supporters, even with what we're talking about now in terms of uh, harm to the country. Think about the, the conversation on Capitol Hill. A majority of both Biden and Trump voters believed electing officials from the opposite party would result in lasting harm to the United States. Isn't that how we got here? Yeah, look, I mean, we, we put that out today. I'm, I'm, I appreciate you mentioning it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the country is, of course, extremely divided. And I think in this in this speaker vote, you ask yourself, well, wait a second, you know, the parties are pretty evenly divided. There are only a handful of more Republicans than Democrats. You know, why can't the, the two parties come together and, and elect a, you know, a sort of a consensus speaker, which we have seen in, mm -hmm. in uh, you know, in state legislatures on occasion and, and, uh, and so on. But uh, I think for so many voters out there, something like that would be seen as sort of a betrayal of one's party um, and as a sort of a, a you know and an, an sort of an unacceptable concession um uh to the other side and so you know and, it, and it's not even like there's there are uh you know great uh, kind of concessions being offered in terms of uh you know electing a cross-party speaker or something like that it just doesn't seem to be something that the system is capable of doing and i think part of it is based on what the individual voters feel and they they're pretty entrenched themselves mm -hmm. Yeah, and very entrenched in their beliefs, not only their own beliefs, but also their beliefs about the other side, as Joe was alluding to. Another striking number here, roughly 40% uh, of both groups, 41% of Biden voters, 38% of Trump voters, at least somewhat believed the other side had become so extreme that it was acceptable to use violence to prevent them from yeah, achieving I mean, their goals. Kyle, we're, in, yeah, we're encouraging... Or uh, okay with with violence now? What did you make of that? Uh, I thought it was a fairly striking and, and frankly fairly fairly depressing um, finding. Um, you know, I, I I think it is fair to say you know we have seen political violence. I mean, certainly I think more prominent amongst uh, you know Donald Trump and his supporters in the act you know the, what happened on, on January 6, twenty twenty one. But I do think that there's this sort of 
perception or a belief among lots of people that the other side is pushing boundaries. And so therefore they're, they, they, they feel like it'd be okay to, for, for their side to push boundaries um, as well. You know, one of the sort of things you always hear from partisans on both sides is just like this, this idea that, Oh, well, we just need to be tougher. The other side is, is amoral and they're tougher and they're going to do all sorts of other stuff. And, you know, that's not a great situation in terms of trying to, you know, uh, 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 calm things down in the United States. I mean, I, you know, one of the things I wish could just happen, which is sort of probably unrealistic to ask for, is just for the temperature of American politics to get turned down a little bit. But if anything, it's yeah. it's it's uh, staying hot or heating up. Well, you've uh, seen this on your own campus, as we all remember the white supremacy march uh, that became a national story, Kyle. Uh, I'm not sure the takeaway here, but it strikes me that to, to see Biden supporters just as much or more in favor of reaching for violence is the story here. Following January 6th, you might not be that surprised to see violence associated with the MAGA base. But these are Democrats we're talking about. These are these are blue voters. Yeah. And, and look, I think some of that has to do with with, the you know, th this feeling about thinking that the other side is going too far. And so therefore, um, you need to sort of like up the ante to, to, to meet it. And, uh, um, you know, again, I mean, I, I think that, you know, January 6, 2021 is is among the worst, you know, the worst thing that's happened in American politics over the past few years. But there have been all lots of other bad things that have happened as well. But, um, you know, again, you just there's just a lot of a lot of distrust, a lot of what we call negative partisanship out there, um, which is, you know, disliking the other side. Um, more than you like your own side. And I think that that's something we see expressed in this survey information that we put out today. And finally, we only have about a minute left with you, Kyle. But uh, of course, as we talk about p presidential politics, and we're talking here about Biden and Trump, who are presumed to be the nominees uh, of each of their parties, former President Trump has waded into the speaker conversation we were having as well. He endorsed Jim Jordan. What does it say if Jim Jordan can't get the gavel about the strength of a Donald Trump endorsement these days? I mean, look, Donald Trump endorsements are something that Republican candidates and primaries are really looking for. And we saw that people, you know, Republicans are falling all over themselves to get Trump endorsements in the in the 2022 election cycle. And I think that probably will continue to be the case in 2024. But, you know, an internal, um, you know, House caucus vote, I think that's a different story. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, the members themselves have a lot of different considerations. And, uh, you know, I, I just I, I mean, I guess there's always a worry about maybe facing primaries or primary challengers backed by Trump. But um, I, I think it might be hard to sort of connect an internal speaker vote uh, to, to, to that sort of primary challenge.